The grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all on this sixth Sunday of Easter. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace. Wherefore let us pray in silence and remember God's presence with us now. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. May the almighty and merciful Lord Grant unto us pardon and remission of our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy 
Gospel reading is from John, the last verse of chapter 20, and the first 18 verses of chapter 21. Jesus gave a great many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that in that faith you may have life as his disciples. Later on, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples on the shore of Lake Tiberias, and he did it in this way. Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together when Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. All right, they replied, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat and during the night caught nothing at all. But just as dawn began to break, Jesus stood there on the beach although the disciples had no idea that it was Jesus. Have you caught anything, lads? Jesus called out to them. No, they replied, nothing. Throw the net on the right side of the boat, said Jesus, and you'll have a catch. So they threw out the net and they found that they were now not strong enough to pull it in because it was so full of fish. At this the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Hearing this, Peter slipped on his clothes, for he had been naked, and he plunged into the sea. The other disciples followed in the boat, for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore, dragging in the net full of fish. When they had landed, they saw that a charcoal fire was burning, with a fish placed in it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring me some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter got into the boat and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three altogether. But in spite of the large numbers, the net was not torn. Then Jesus said to them, Come and have your breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask who he was. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus went and took the bread and gave it to them and gave them all fish as well. This is already the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others? Yes, Lord, he replied. You know that I am your friend. Then feed my lambs, returned Jesus. Then he said for a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, returned Peter. You know that I am your friend. Then care for my sheep, replied Jesus. Then for the third time, Jesus spoke to him and said, Simon, son of John, are you my friend? Peter was deeply hurt because Jesus' third question to him was, Are you my friend? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I am your friend. Then feed my sheep, Jesus said to him.
for the sixth Sunday of Easter. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. By which I mean, Jesus Christ is the extraordinary wrapped up in the ordinary. Allow me to explain. And to begin, we think of our gospel reading. Now the story in John chapter 21 is that of an ordinary fishing trip with extraordinary consequences. In the post-crucifixion and empty tomb confusion, Simon Peter seeks reassurance in the pursuit of the mundane. Very strange things, very strange events have happened, and what this fisherman needs is a fugue into the familiar. Back soon, gone fishing. It is the story of a commonplace exchange between fishermen in a boat and an observer on the shore. I see the shawl, cast your net over to the right. And then a realisation that all is not as commonplace as first it seemed. John identifies the shore observer as Jesus. It is the Lord. Splash, and over the side, quicker than quick, goes Simon Peter, breathlessly bound for the shore, for a chastening challenge, and in the long run, for Rome. John chapter 21 is rather odd. It reads like an add-on, the narrator's afterthought. Oh, and another thing. The climax of John's narrative is perhaps in chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas the Doubter cries out to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And this is followed by our text for this evening. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is a kind of mission statement in the best sense of that phrase. All of this is recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. However, addendum, though chapter 21 may be, it does tell a good tale. A tale of an astonishing haul of fish, a barbecue on the beach, and for Peter, the thrice stated directive to tend and feed the Lord's sheep. This, the antidote to Peter's thrice given cockcrow denial. The chapter ends with a masterstroke of the writer's art. There were so many other things that Jesus did, the world couldn't hold all the books that could be written about them. How's that for a cliffhanger? Now the reason I love the stories of Jesus, his birth, healings, teachings, his preaching, his passion and all that followed, is that they are suffused with the ordinary. The people, places, plights, conversations, accusations and so on. All human life is there as the Sunday newspaper used to declare. In them is the everyday experience of men and women then and, in essence, now. True, there are trappings of the un unusual angels over Bethlehem and in the empty tomb, a stilling of a storm, breathtaking feats of healing to make any GP feel inadequate. But in all, we have no difficulty picturing the sweaty brows and dusty feet of Jesus, his disciples and the crowds around them, do we? The matrix of Jesus's life and his responses to predicament were usually 
wonderfully ordinary. Predicament. Not a single bite, all blooming night. Response. Don't despair, fisherman. Cast your net on the right side. Now I say that his responses were usually ordinary. Some of his responses, in truth, were undoubtedly extraordinary. They were, well, miraculous, beyond our ken. But then, that's God for you, Nespa. We believe that God was in Jesus. That he was indeed the extraordinary wrapped up in the ordinary. The wonder of the gospel is its relevance to where we are in all the seasons of our lives. Whatever's happening, whatever's happening, there is some saying of the Lord that is mightily pertinent. Try it out in your own experience. Think back over the circumstances and events of the past little while and see if there isn't some observation or action of Jesus that speaks to you in each recollection. Here, for example, are three of mine that happened a few years ago in the space of 36 hours. I was called by the police to a young woman of 30 found dead. In all probability, she died alone and unpleasantly. I sat with her brother. He was bewildered. Why? Usually a stoical sort of fellow, his emotional resistance crumbled and he cried like a little boy. John chapter 11. To Martha and Mary. Where have you put him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they answered. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Thomas Tallis, his setting of Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Hear my cry. The following day, another event with sadness, because we were interring the ashes of a dear old lady, but with celebration because we remembered her cheerfulness and brightness of spirit, her service to others, her uncomplaining long-suffering, and we celebrated her life in a beautiful English churchyard on a springtime afternoon, brimming with new life and green magnificence. May time, and it's most glorious. Luke 12, 27. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field. Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like these. And the day after that, in another church, I baptised a wee infant called Jacob. We, well, yes, I suppose so. Although he was a healthy 10 months old, I had to concentrate very hard not to drop him in the font. There were lots of delightfully noisy little children in the church, eager to know what the vicar was going to do with a baby. Matthew 19, 14. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. And in paraphrase, he told his listeners to approach the kingdom of heaven with the naive and noisy enthusiasm of little children. The kaleidoscope of living. Bright illustrations in the gospel narratives. There are many parallels between our experience of this sintering rainbow of life and those that fill the days, months and years of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the whole wonder of the Incarnation, isn't it? Emmanuel, God with us, beside us, among us. The maker of the universe with his sleeves rolled up in the soap suds of humanity. God with us. 
I should say that is at least remarkable. No, it's not. It's astonishing. It would appear from the evidence of the Gospels that we are not wandering alone. We are not wandering alone among the slings and arrows and glories and joys of life with the vagaries of our living. God, whom Jesus called Father, is a part of our everyday ordinariness and we ignore his involvement to our peril and to our loss. God the extraordinary has a providential hand in the ordering of all our ordinary lives. Cast your net to the right, fisherman. When you think about it, that the Creator should be involved in the creature to the extent of precise instructions, that's amazing. Not only amazing, but vastly reassuring and heartwarming and, well, extraordinary. Amen. Let us pray. O Christ, kindle within our hearts a flame of love to our neighbours, to our foes, to our friends, to our kindred all. O Christ of the poor and the yearning, from the humblest thing that lives to the name that is highest of all, kindle in our hearts within a flame of love. Amen. Trinity of love, you have been with us at the world's beginning. Be with us till the world's end. You have been with us at our life's shaping. Be with us at our life's end. You have been with us at the sun's rising. Be with us at the day's end. Amen. As you go on your way, go forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast that which is good, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, render to no man evil for evil, love, honour and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you those whom you love and those for whom you pray, now and always. Amen. Amen.